Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. Uh, so we've been looking ahead, as today is December 1st, that what we're going to look at this fall. And this fall, we're going to finish our series on Luke. We've been going through the book of Luke. And small groups, which begin next week, fall small groups begin next week. See, I'm just going to claim fall from like right now. We're going to hope for the cold weather. <laughs> And the small groups begin next week, and they're going to end out our series on Luke. So if you join the small group, we have uh, sign-ups on the table. There's four different ones, and the small groups are going to follow questions that go along with the sermons every week. So we'll get to dive into this and learn from the life and teachings of Jesus through the end of the book of Luke together. So last week, we were in chapter 13 of Luke, and we talked about uh, Jesus healing the bent-over woman and the parable of the mustard seed, and the um, small things in the kingdom of God, and how even things that seem really small are big things in the kingdom of God, that they make the lasting impact and they grow the kingdom here. So after that story, Jesus continued to travel around and teach, and he eventually makes his way to Jerusalem. And when he gets there, People tell him that it's not safe for him to be there, and they tell him to leave. So that's where we're picking up this morning, looking at Luke 13, starting at verse 31. Hear the word of the Lord. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you are not willing. Look at your houses left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. There's a lot going on in this passage. There's a foretelling of Jesus' death. There is a um, telling of the plot to kill Jesus and foreshadowing of what we now call Palm Sunday when Jesus rides in to Jerusalem. But I don't want to focus on any of that this morning. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> what I want to focus on is one statement that Jesus makes in this passage, and that is, how often I have longed to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. So in the midst of everything going on in this passage, Jesus makes a statement that shows us that he is more than simply a carpenter, a son of a carpenter turned preacher who's 30 years old, right? This is not something that a 30-year-old says, oh, I've longed for so long to gather you. This gives us a glimpse into Jesus' divinity. This is a longing of God's that God has had for so long that Jesus looks at Jerusalem, the children of Israel, and has this longing to gather them. And this statement shows a difference, a different view for us. It reveals to us another side of God we might not be familiar with, and that is a feminine side of God. In our culture today, it's rather common for us in the Christian world to refer to God as Father, and to use mostly male pronouns, and to talk about God mostly in a male way. This is in our songs, and our prayers. It's all over uh, how we verbalize the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God as Father is beautiful imagery. It's beautiful imagery reminding us that God is approachable, is familial, that we are God's children, and it serves this wonderful purpose. But God as Father is also, like every metaphor, inadequate. Because in metaphors are just ideas of us to try to relate to a bigger idea. 
They're narrow and they're limited. And there's more to God than simply what comes to mind when we think of a father. Because our human understandings are limited, all of our attempts to describe God will also be limited. It's just natural. So we need various different ways to describe God, various different ways to approach God, to come before God, to relate to God. And hopefully all these together can give us a bigger picture of what God looks like. Jesus reminds us here that there is another way. Besides Father, for us to understand and relate to God, another metaphor that is available. How often I have longed to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. God, it turns out, is not offended and does not shy away from feminine descriptions and metaphors. For Jesus here describes his own longings in terms of mothering. A mother hen gathering her chicks Now, I do not live on a farm, although there are some here who do. I am not around chicks and hens almost ever unless I go to the Kratz farm. So I looked up YouTube, and there are videos of like a dog coming close to a hen with her chicks, and immediately all the chicks just gather to the hen, to the mother hen, and try to hide under her wings. I have a few pictures because I knew video wouldn't really work in here, and pictures are a little bit iffy too. But you see all the little chicks just find a way to try to hide under the feathers of the mother hen. There's another one here. This one actually looks like just one bird, and then you see all these little legs poking out from the, like that mother is really hiding those chicks, you know? But I love this imagery even if I have to go online to see it, and I can't see it outside my back door, like some can. I love this. It's interesting to see just how a mother hen can protect and hide her chicks, if there's any danger, to just, to just hide them in her feathers so that they are not vulnerable, but they look like one big chicken. This is not the first instance in scripture here when Jesus says this, that God is described as a mother hen. Uh, Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Psalm 17, 8. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Psalm 57, 1. God will cover you with feathers and under God's wings you will find refuge. Psalm 91, 4. May you be richly rewarded by the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Ruth 2, 12. God is also described not just as a mother hen, but as a mother eagle, pushing her children to fly. Uh, God guarded Jacob as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. Deuteronomy 32, 10 through 11. Unless we think that all the motherly imagery in scripture is about caring and nurturing, Hosea 13.8 reminds us that that's not always true. And God says, like a bear robbed of her cubs, I will attack them and rip them open. (laughs) So beware the fury of a mother. (laughs) But there are also instances where God is described as a human mother as one whom his mother comforts, so I, God, will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem, Isaiah 66, 13. For a long time, I, God, have kept silent. I have kept quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp and pant, Isaiah 42, 14. As a mother comforts her child, so I, God, will comfort you. Isaiah 66, these are human mother imagery being pulled in to describe God. This is not just something that Jesus says in the New Testament, but all throughout. This one is my personal favorite from Isaiah 46, 3 through 4. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnant of the people of Israel, you who I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born. Even in your old age and gray hairs, I am the one who will sustain you. I have made you and carried you. I will sustain you. I will rescue you. In all of these passages, and there are many more, 
we see this glimpse of God looking to God's people with a mothering heart, with a feminine heart. And these examples go well beyond the ones that I have read. God is comfortable describing God's own character and mission in this world in feminine terms. And we see this throughout Scripture, and here Jesus is no exception to this. There are three instances in the Gospels that I could think of where Jesus describes his work or talks about his work in images that really seem very female. So the first one is the hen and the chicks from Luke 13. This really shows us this longing that Jesus has. Jerusalem, I long to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks. I long to protect you. I long to bring you in and save you from danger. The second one is the idea of being born again. Remember this? When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and Jesus says in John chapter 3, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they have been born again. And Nicodemus says, well, how can a person possibly go back into their mother's womb and be born again? That does not sound comfortable on this side of things, so good question. And Jesus tells him, no, no, you must be born of me. You must be born from above. Jesus in John 3 describes his own work, his mission in this world with a feminine imagery, a feminine idea childbirth. And what an image to choose. <laughs> I mean, Leif and I are in a, a childbirth class right now, and we've had to watch a lot of videos. <laughs> and it's a very graphic image, I have to say. <laughs> what an interesting thing for Jesus to choose. <laughs> childbirth. Jesus isn't repulsed by something so feminine. Jesus isn't offended at its utterance in his presence. In fact, he's the one who brings it up. Jesus isn't tainted somehow by this female imagery being associated with him. Jesus openly uses feminine metaphors of childbirth to describe himself and his mission and why he has come to this earth. This passage, for me, the one from John 3, shines this new light even on the creation narrative in Genesis. As God births the world into being, and then we are reborn through Jesus into new creations. The third example in the Gospels where Jesus uses this imagery that just seems strikingly feminine is found in all four Gospels, in Matthew 16, and Mark 14, and Luke 22, and John 13. It's something that we say every week here at Wellspring, and it is the story of the Last Supper. As Jesus gathers some of his disciples together and then says, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you, all to bring you new life. How similar to what a new mother can say to her newborn baby. My body broken, my blood shed for you. And I love these feminine metaphors. Uh, as a woman, I don't think you have to be a literal mother to experience the, uh, the impact of God associating with feminine imagery and to appreciate it. I found these metaphors in my 20s, and I held on to them because they gave my faith new life, especially as a woman, because it's powerful when you discover that a God who you've always talked about in male terms, in terms that don't associate with you, father, son, even husband, you use he, his, him. It's powerful when you realize that that God, throughout Scripture, chooses to identify and be known through female images and metaphors. It's powerful when you discover that you can relate to God as a woman because God relates to you through the things that you go through. It brings a deeper understanding of being made in God's image for women who we don't often hear God spoken about in this way. I remember the first time I thought of something Jesus did as a feminine thing, and it was with communion. Uh, years ago now, I was at a church, and it was my first Sunday there, one of my first Sundays. And at this church, when they did communion, they didn't say, Jesus' body broken for you, Jesus' blood shed for you. They said, my body broken for you, my blood shed for you. 
And I went up to take communion, and a pregnant woman was serving it. And to hear her say, my body broken for you, my blood shed for you, it just opened up this whole new understanding for me of, of a way to relate to Jesus, of an image that I could look at and say, okay, this is something that represents in some way what Jesus was coming here to do. And that was powerful for me. So why is it important to experience the feminine side of God? This verse in Luke 13, why is this important to pull out of this confusing passage? I think to acknowledge and be aware that this is in our Bible, this is an important part of our faith. Reason number one, it's important for the development of women. I think for women and girls to hear about God being talked about in such a way gives us dignity and shows us, makes it obvious that the church and the people of the church and the God we worship are not offended by our femininity and they're not offended by being associated with things that are female. Because kids pick up on what we say and what we don't say, right? And for girls to grow up knowing that there is this whole side of God, this aspect of God that they can relate to and that God relates with them in, I think that's really powerful for faith development. Reason number two, why it's important to experience this feminine side of God, it's important for all people to be able to access these metaphors without shame or fear. I think this helps actually to the development of everybody, for those who maybe didn't have a father. And we talk so much about God as father, and yet they can't really relate to what that means, or it doesn't give them an image of what that looks like. Or for people whose father was not necessarily their picture of love and forgiveness, but perhaps their mother was. And maybe that opens up a parental view, a familial view of God that allows them to come to God anew. Or, as my dad pointed out when I spoke to him about this this week, even if you have a great father, because he thinks I really did, <laughs> perhaps you also have a great mother, and you have these whole other characteristics that you haven't associated, you haven't brought in from your mother, and yet this parental figure of God who who creates you and then recreates you in Jesus, who births you and then goes through your rebirth, maybe you now have access to all of these other ideas and this imagery that you might be able to pull from when relating to God. So it's important for the development of faith of women. It's important for the development of faith of everybody. And it helps us understand God more fully. God is not a man. Surprise, surprise. God is spirit, according to scriptures, and God is neither male nor female, being spirit. And in creation, when God created humanity in God's image, it took both male and female to accomplish that. And I think we know this in our brains, right? We know this, but when we experience things in church and we talk about God as he or him or his, then we kind of forget and we, we begin to chafe at the idea that we describe God any other way than the way that seems familiar to us. But even the gendered pronouns are simply metaphors to help us understand and relate to God and, and doesn't really represent our full understanding. Our language is limited. Our understanding is limited. Theologian Lynn Japinga wrote, Language about God should help us to understand and encounter God, but we should not confuse reality of God with the limits of our own language. Although we speak most often, in other words, about God as male, that's merely one way for us to relate to and understand God. It doesn't mean God is a male. Our language is simply limited. Does that make sense? To understand God in only male terms is not an accurate picture of God. It is a limited one. It's a narrow and limited understanding. The Bible doesn't paint God in this male-only view. This is a cultural Christian thing that we have done. There are female images in the Bible to learn from and lean into. And being able to relate to God in both female and male ways, knowing that both of them are limited even when they're together, can help us build this bigger picture. 
God as a loving parent, this loving parent who is always reaching out and raising us and growing us into God's own likeness. Why is it important to experience the feminine side of God for our faith development and to help us understand God more fully? But this also gives us a deeper understanding of the mission that Jesus came to do. Uh, as we're going through Luke, we're talking about why did Jesus come? We're, we're seeing him travel around and talk consistently about the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is here on earth, that God crossed the barrier, came to earth to build it here. So what is this kingdom about? Well, one of the ways we can understand this idea of the kingdom of God is through these feminine images. This helps us understand Jesus's mission. So being open to feminine imagery gives us this other way of understanding what Jesus came to do, and therefore, our Christian walk, what we're doing here on earth to, to spread the kingdom and to build it. So these three feminine images that Jesus uses throughout Scripture, throughout the New Testament, they protect us. Uh, a mother hen, this view of a mother hen, <laughs> and a little baby who needs a mother. <laughs> this view of the mother hen and her chicks, this gives us an idea that Jesus came to protect us from all the powers of the world that had, en that had enslaved us. It also gives us this image of a God who wants to gather us, perhaps from our isolation, from each other and from God, gathering all these little chicks together instead of apart as one family. This idea of being born again, of what Jesus did, this gives us a different view of the pain that Jesus went through, the labor that Jesus went through to accomplish what he came to accomplish. This was truly to bring us a new life. The old is gone, the new has come as if a new baby has been born. That's a drastic view of a new life that Jesus came to bring. We are not the same as we were before Jesus. We are also not mature. We are like babies. So, you know, it's actually a good thing, Amanda. Yeah. <laughs> We are like little babies that we must be raised and grown and molded into the image that we were created to bear. And I like this because uh, the Christian life for some can be this really drastic change where you experience Jesus, you give your life over to Jesus and it's like this big rebirth and you're completely different. But for others, it can be like you are this little baby and you are slowly being raised into the likeness of Jesus. And perhaps that journey is more gradual. That You can't look back and say, this was the moment that I really became a Christian. But you can look back and say, throughout all this time, God was pulling me along and growing me and raising me as a parent would. I love that imagery. But either way, this, this view of Jesus as a mother gives us, and this idea that we were being reborn gives us language of what Jesus came to do that we wouldn't have otherwise. The third instance that Jesus uses feminine imagery of, as we talked about, was the body broken, the blood shed. Well, this gives us that really graphic image of a mother in labor. Maybe this gives us a glimpse of the necessity of the cross. Labor is necessary for birth. Perhaps the cross was necessary for our rebirth. As we talked about uh, just after Easter, perhaps it really is that Jesus came and lured all the powers of evil to one place at the cross. And it looked like Jesus was going to be defeated, but then he ended up being the victor. You remember when we talked about this? This is what it seems like to me. Body broken, blood shed, this, this necessary thing. For the powers of death to be taken care of once and for all, for us to have this life. As someone who's thinking a lot about labor and childbirth at this season, it also gives me a different view of the scars that women might have. As you look at the story of Jesus and after his death and then resurrection, and he still has these scars from the labor he went through. Perhaps the things that happen to a mother physically that don't necessarily go away, the stretch marks, various other things, 
Perhaps that's similar to Jesus' scars that stayed even after the resurrection. Proof that he had brought us through this, that he had given us new life, that we will always remember every time we see them. Being open to feminine imagery that Jesus uses gives us this deeper understanding of what he came to do, a different way to interpret it, a different way to relate to it. And I know that many Christians today are really uneasy with this idea. We don't talk about a lot of these things that women go through in general in our culture, so even that is shocking. But this is not a radical agenda or a new innovation. This is in Scripture. This is in our pages of our holy book. And throughout Christian history, giants of our faith have clung to these images, these feminine images, and it has helped them become closer to God. I looked at the early church father, Clement of Alexandria. He wrote about the Christian life as nursing at the breast of God and said the word, Christ, is everything to his little ones, father and mother. Jesus is everything we need. John Chrysostom, who wrote in the 4th century, said, Thou art my father, thou art my mother, thou art my brother, thou art my friend, thou art my servant, thou art housekeeper, Thou art the all, and the all is in thee. Thou art being, and there is nothing that is except thou. God is all-encompassing, everything we could think of. The great theologian Augustine said that for just as mother suckling her infant transfers from her flesh the very same food that would be otherwise unsuitable for a baby, so our Lord, in order to convert his wisdom into milk for our benefit, came to us clothed in flesh, came to us clothed as Jesus. It is the body of Christ, then, that here says, and thou shalt nourish me. The 14th century holy woman Julian of Norwich said, Jesus Christ, who himself overcame evil with good, is our true mother. We received our being from him, and this is where his maternity starts. And with it comes the gentle protection and guard of love, which will never cease to surround us. Just as God is our father, so also is God our mother. These giants of faith that appear throughout Christian history, and there are so many more of these examples as well, found solace and comfort in the image of God as mother. And I hope that we can learn from them, because if these giants of our faith are not afraid to associate God with feminine imagery, then why should we be afraid of knowing God in these ways? If God throughout the Bible isn't afraid of associating with feminine terms, then why should we be afraid to speak about God in such ways? If Jesus throughout the Gospels isn't afraid to describe his work in this world through feminine imagery, then why should we be afraid to understand Jesus' work in our lives in this way? Jesus in Luke 13 reminds us that the work of God in the world and the work of God in our lives is the work of a mother giving birth, bringing new life, and raising her children into her likeness. This builds our faith anew. It helps us understand God in different ways and gives us a different understanding of Jesus' mission and work here on earth. So I want to end our time this morning by giving you a moment to reflect on a couple questions. We're going to put those up here. So take some, a few moments right now this morning to reflect on these.